In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glorious Saint Joseph, spouse of the Virgin Mary, we beseech you through the heart of Jesus Christ, grant to us your fatherly protection. O you whose power reaches all our necessities, and who knows how to make possible the most impossible things, open your fatherly eyes to the needs of your children. In the confusion and pain which press upon us, we have recourse to you with confidence. Deign to take beneath your charitable guidance this important and difficult affair, the cause of our worries, and make that its happy outcome serve for the glory of God and the good of his devoted servants. Amen. Heavenly Father, on this 16th day of our consecration to St. Joseph, we come to you once again asking you to pour out your Holy Spirit upon us so that we can come to know and love the great St. Joseph and that he can guide us closer to Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I got a really bright light here. Um, looks okay to me, but if it doesn't look right to you, let me know. I, I think it looks okay. And I'm sitting right under St. Joseph's hand, so it looks like he's given me his uh, paternal fatherly blessing, which is awesome. So I decided we're you know, I'm practically halfway through, so I wanted to just change up the background um, and it's really nice, isn't it? This is, remember, this is one of the ones that you can buy, not this size. You buy the canvas image, which is about that big. And it's one of the ones that you can win in the can that canvas image size in the contest at the end. So I just wanted to change it up a little bit. A um, few things from yesterday. You know, quite a few people send me private messages about uh, miracles that are happening or have happened or ha have recently happened, as recent as, you know, the last couple of days. Um, about St. Joseph interceding for family members and their health or a uh, particular situation that's going on in a marriage or, you know, relationships. Praise God. Um, that I get a lot of those, which is wonderful. So I, I'm not really talking too much about those because sometimes they're really long, the descriptions, and I just, it, it would take a very long time to go through those. But praise God that um, St. Joseph is, you know, doing his wonders, doing what he does, being a good father and, uh, you know, really helping out in, in situations. Another thing um, somebody had mentioned, and I, I just assumed that everybody would know this, like whenever, because somebody was asking, Father, where does the money go when, you know, we buy stuff from you uh, or, you know, we, we get stuff from the website? Uh, yeah, it doesn't go to me. <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I don't get any money for that. It goes to the religious community. So like when you go to fathercalloway.com, for example, where you find out about the pilgrimages and all that, um, you'll notice that all that stuff, when you buy something that goes to Shop Mercy, which is my religious community's website. And, you know, I have my own website, but that doesn't mean that the money's coming to me. I don't get a dime from that stuff. And that's, that's the right. You know, I, I, I've made vows of poverty, chastity and obedience. So I don't see that. It goes to my religious community. Same thing with consecration to stjoseph.org. Um, you know, my community set it up. And when you buy something, all that money, it goes to the religious community. It doesn't go to me. So, you know, just in case you're wondering about that, for sure, um, it doesn't go to me. It goes to the community. Um, let's see. Oh, yes. Another thing that somebody brought up that I guess I just I wasn't clear enough about it yesterday. It's a good point. I'm glad that she raised it. Um, one lady said, Father... Um, you talked about St. Joseph's workshop in Nazareth, but um, how is it still there if you said that the Muslims came through in 1296 and completely sacked the town of Nazareth? How is it that people can visit St. Joseph's workshop? Well, yeah, you're totally right. So what I meant was that's the location where St. Joseph's workshop was. I mean, that was completely sacked as well. So in most of those places where there is now a church, it's built on top of where something once was it's the exact location but the church that's usually there now is either was either built by the crusaders when they came back to try and reclaim the holy land or even sometimes even more modern you know times they've built something which oftentimes is not, not as attractive i mean you'll you'll know what i'm talking about you know a lot of modern architecture to me is like uh, um let's go back to like the 15th century 16th century stuff you know um, it's not that complicated, guys. You know, it's just make it beautiful. We don't need these whitewashed bunkers that are just like nasty. The only way I can close is, uh, pray, pray in those is to close my eyes so I don't see what I'm seeing. Um, not saying that that's the case here. It's not with St. Joseph's Workshop, the church. Uh, it's also called the Church of the Nutrition. Because remember, 
In Latin, it's filii dei nutritiae. Uh, we translate that foster father of the son of God, but it's nutritiae. He's the nurturer. So that's also the name of that particular church, St. Joseph's Workshop or the Church of the Nutrition. Fascinating. So um, sorry if I wasn't clear on that. So you're not like going there and checking out St. Joseph's like workbench and the tools that he used, you know, or, or anything like that. All that stuff, you know, was destroyed, but it's the location where it is. So, but great, great point. I'm glad that you brought that up. Okay. We got a lot of ground to cover again today, my friends. And I apologize today, again, was another one of those long readings, really long. Um, <clears throat> so uh, it's just the way that it is because there's so much that I have to get across. So let's go to day 16 where from the Litany of St. Joseph, we read, Joseph, most just, pray for us. I start with a quote from Pope Pius XI. By the way, he was an awesome pope. He doesn't get the attention that he deserves. Um, he was a no-nonsense pope. He just said it like it was. Uh, he upset a lot of people, but I'm fine with that. I mean, the truth hurts, man. And uh, he, he hammered the truth, which is great. So he said, he, St. Joseph, won for himself the title of the just man and thus serves as a living model of that Christian justice which should reign in social life. Now, before we proceed any further, it's good that we set, we get a definition for what justice is <clears throat> because you hear that a lot today, all over the place. So the Christian understanding of justice as a virtue and it's something that we're called to practice, um, can actually be practiced even towards God. So we can exercise the virtue of justice, and we need to, even in our relationship with God, and actually primarily in our relationship with God. So let me give you, and this is going to be important for what we're going to read in the second reading today, because if you don't have this in your head, you might start thinking, hmm, I'm not, this isn't convincing to me. But once you have this definition, you'll understand uh, what's going on. So theologians, <clears throat> and not just theologians, but, you know, they work it out. And then the church, you know, affirms it uh, in official, you know, documents. And you find it in encyclicals and the catechism and so forth. Uh, so theologians define the virtue of justice as, quote, giving to another his due. For example, in our relationship with God, we owe it to him to be grateful for our existence and to praise him for his goodness. We act justly towards God, giving him his due when we worship him, especially by our participation in Holy Mass on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation. If we fail to do this, we are not loving God. We are not acting justly towards God. We are not giving him his due. Now, I remember when I was a seminarian, you know, fresh in my studies, and somebody said to me, because I went to a Dominican um, seminary, which was fantastic, you know, studied the Summa of St. Thomas, not a lot of this modern garbage. Um, and um, it talked about things I had never really heard of. Like they were talking about, you need to act justly towards God. And I was like, I don't understand what that means. But then when I, you know, learned from these great theologians, St. Thomas and many others, a definition like this, I was like, oh, that makes total sense. I mean, I, God made me and I should be grateful for that. And he is owed my, you know, faithfulness and, 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 and my service and I should worship him. And he's told me how to do that uh, in the New Testament very clearly. And he did in the Old Testament as well. But now we have the New Testament and the New Covenant. And it's very clear that, you know, we have to do this in memory of him the Holy Mass, the Last Supper. Um, so very, very, very clear. So what's important to know, too, is that God is not the only one, of course, that we are to act justly towards. You also need to give others their due, because we don't just, you know, we're not living on an isolated place where it's just you and God. There's you know, relationships everywhere. Uh, do you love, venerate, and honor Mary, your spiritual mother? She's worthy of your veneration, and it's actually due to her because of who she is. Do you love, venerate, and honor St. Joseph, your spiritual father? Do you treat members of your family with love, respect, and dignity because it's owed to them? 
It is. That's amazing to think about. Sometimes it doesn't seem like it should be because you see all their faults and transgressions and sometimes they wound you and so forth. But that that relationship is there and they're still made in the image and likeness of God and they're owed respect. You don't want to take away their their dignity. What about your neighbors, co-workers and everyone else with whom you daily interact? If you're an employer, do you offer a just wage? Remember the golden rule. Do unto others what you would have them do unto you. Your spiritual father acted justly and lovingly toward everyone, especially God. Keep that definition in mind. To be just is to give others their due. What belongs to them, you don't take from them. And what is owed to them, you give to them. Keep that in mind. That's essential for understanding where we're going to go next. So let's turn to page 141. Uh, to the just and reverent man. This is good stuff. Oh, this is stuff. When I discovered this, along, I discovered this part of the book a long time ago. When I was in seminary, I uh, was kind of turned on to the, these, this understanding of where we're going to go right now. And I was like, totally. That makes so much sense to me. And it, it, it reveals something great about St. Joseph that so many people are unaware of, completely unaware of. All right. So I start with the quote from St. Francis de Sales in this section where he says, to be just is to be perfectly united to the divine will and to be always conformed to it in all sorts of events, whether prosperous or adverse. That St. Joseph was this, no one can doubt. Now that's St. Francis de Sales. So remember, if you're called to give to God what belongs to him, not take it away, and whether it's of prosperous to you or adverse, meaning whether you're, you're going to benefit from it on, on an emotional level, on a physical level, or whether you're going to be deprived of certain goods, when you act justly towards God, you're willing to undergo whatever because you don't want to take away what belongs to God. Remember that. Now, the church has always understood St. Joseph to be a just and holy man, always, loving God and neighbor as he ought. But it hasn't always understood the deeper theological significance of what those words actually mean, that he's a just man, especially when applied to certain actions of St. Joseph observed in the New Testament. It has taken the church centuries to advance a theology of St. Joseph that shows his greatness and his holiness. And as I've been saying, it's been only within the last 150 years that we've come to this, and we're still coming to this. And I think, again, that we're headed somewhere to an end here that is going. the church is going to recognize the greatness of St. Joseph on so many different levels, and one of them is going to be the justice that he exercised towards God. Because, you know, in the beginning of the book, I talk about, you know, the first theological journal of Josephology, of theologians thinking deeply on this. And you can, you're, you'd can you be amazed at how you can, you know, get theologians who will just make distinctions after distinctions after distinctions about the most minute, small things and can write an 80-page article on it with citations in, in Greek and, and Latin and German and, you know, Italian and French and just mind-blowing. But it's fascinating, you know, when, when, you, when you realize what they're doing and the arguments, the systematic method that they're using to, to, to bring about, you know, a greater awareness of things. So this is what's been happening with St. Joseph. It's been there for a long time. It just hasn't been really brought to the fore uh, until recently. So, today, the church teaches that St. Joseph is the holiest human person after the Virgin Mary, and the most just, remember, that's the superlative, only he and Our Lady have that. No other saint can be called most just, or most courageous, or most humble, or most whatever. Only Mary and Joseph have that most. He is our spiritual father, and the pillar of families the glory of domestic life, the patron of the universal church, and the terror of demons. For this reason, certain passages in the New Testament that present the actions of St. Joseph 
need to be re-examined in light of what is now unequivocally taught by the church to be true about St. Joseph. Namely, that St. Joseph, as he confronted all sorts of events, whether advantageous or adverse, always acted in accords with God's will and gave God and others their due. All right. So what, what passage am I talking about here in particular in the New Testament? It's in Matthew. And I'm going to read it to you. So you've heard it a million times. But I'm going to read a version to you, officially approved by the Catholic Church. It comes from the RSVCE, the Revised Standard Version, Catholic Edition, fully approved you know, by the bishops, stamp of approval from the Catholic Church. This is what I want you to hear. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, but before they, they came together, she was found to be with child of the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to send her away quietly. But as he considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife. Now, I looked up at a certain point in that because I wanted you, hopefully, to, to, to get what I was doing there. There's a certain word that I did not read. Do you know what it is? Because I bet you many of your Bibles use the word. But this one, officially approved by the Catholic Church, doesn't. What is it? That he did not want to divorce Mary. Yes. Many times you will read in certain translations the word divorce. Why is it in this officially approved translation that we don't have that? It says that he resolved to send her away quietly. My friends, there is a massive difference between wanting to divorce someone and wanting to step out quietly from the scene, to separate yourself from that scene quietly. What's up with that? Why is the church allow why does the church allow for multiple translations of this? Well, it all hinges on one particular word in Greek, apoluo. Now we won't get too technical here, but it hinges upon the translation of that word and the context in which you understand Joseph is he the second greatest person after the Blessed Virgin Mary? Or is he not? Is he, you know, so super virtuous, the most just? Or is he not? Well, the church has grown in this understanding throughout the centuries. And now we believe that he is. And that translation of that word, apoluo, we got to relook at that. We've got to see if we've actually been translating that word correctly. Because some people from the very beginning have never said that it should be translated as divorce. And I'll go through that as we continue. And this is getting stronger and stronger. Now that we've, we're unpacking the greatness, the dignity, the wonders, the titles, the virtues of St. Joseph, it needs to be looked at. Did you know that for from the beginning, there have been of the church three possibilities for understanding this episode in the life of Our Lady and St. Joseph. When he discovers that his wife is pregnant, his response, his desired action, once he discovers that. The church has allowed for three different ways of understanding it. Now, I want to go through those with you. And I'm not, I don't, don't, please don't get the impression that I'm forcing you to believe one particular way. I believe one particular way, and I believe it very, very strongly. And I actually think that the church in time, as we continue with this age of St. Joseph, will also at some point come to this understanding in a more fuller way. But let's go through them. The first 
is what's been called the suspicion theory. St. Joseph suspects Mary of adultery. And as a result, he decides to obtain a divorce. Remember, because they're already married. Right? According to Jewish law, if a just man wants to divorce his wife because she has been unfaithful, he's required to stone her. I mean, that's in the prescripts in the Old Testament. You can look it up and find it. So he, Joseph, being a just man, he doesn't want to stone Mary. So he seeks to divorce her quietly. I'm not actually sure what a quiet marriage is, but at any rate, this theory was promoted in the apocryphal literature. Remember, I've been talking about that stuff. Legends, myths, fairy tales, but it was put in the apocryphal literature. But some fathers of the church did buy into it, especially in the East, in the Eastern churches. So, okay. All right. So we got some fathers of the church. We got some saints actually buying into this. So it begins to be promoted on some level, this understanding that he wanted to divorce her, but he was just, he didn't want to stone her. He was a good man. So, but he thought she had cheated on him. That's the first option. The second is called the stupefaction theory. I love this title because who, who uses that word, right? Stupefaction. But it's called the stupefaction theory. St. Joseph is perplexed and stupefied by Mary's pregnancy. I mean, yeah, it'd be a wonder, right? But he does not doubt Mary's innocence. He's dumbfounded and doesn't know what to do. Confused, he decides to divorce Mary. Some fathers of the church adhere to this theory and greatly promote it. It becomes the most common theory of what took place and what St. Joseph wanted to do and is known as Joseph's doubt. He doubts. So this is why if you look in certain translations of the scriptures, not the one that I read to you, but maybe like maybe the New American Bible, I, I, don't, I don't have them in front of me, so it could be, I could be wrong there. But in a lot of them, it's that title. You know, sometimes in the New Testament, you get a title that's put in there by the church to describe that section. So you'll get like the Annunciation or you'll get John the Baptist or the Wedding of Cana or whatever, right? It, that, that, you know. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John didn't have those there, but the church later put those little titles for that little section you're going to read. Well, in a lot of Bibles, you will read, when you're reading this particular passage, it's titled, Joseph's Doubt. But it's interesting that in the ones that we're go I'm going to read you next, the third theory, it's not called Joseph's Doubt. You know what it's called? Joseph's Annunciation. It puts a more positive spin on what is going to take place because of the interpretation of what Joseph, uh, his response was and what he wanted to do. So the third theory is called the reverence theory. St. Joseph discovers that Mary is pregnant, but he does not doubt her purity and innocence. Instead, he doubts his worthiness and ability to take care of Mary and the child. A just man, he knows that Mary belongs to God. Remember that definition of justice. As a just man, he knows that Mary belongs to God, and he considers himself unworthy of living with her. He decides to separate himself from her quietly out of justice to God and reverence for Mary. He is willing to leave the picture so as not to reveal her mystery. Some fathers of the church, as well as many medieval saints, theologians, and mystics, promote this theory. Now, which one do you think I adhere to? <laughs> it's a no-brainer. The reverence theory. Because this is shows the greatness of St. Joseph. Myself, I very highly doubt that he thought that Mary cheated on him. We are talking about a man who was well aware of the prophecies of the Old Testament, like in Isaiah, that when the Messiah would come, behold, a virgin would conceive this child, the Messiah. He wasn't dumb. He wasn't some, you know, ignorant, you know, guy living out in the woods, unaware of the scriptures. He knew. And all of a sudden, he found himself encountering this mystery. And guess who it was? His wife. <laughs> He knew she didn't cheat on him. That man kissed the ground she walked on. He knew that that woman was holy. He was well aware of this. And, you know, 
he wouldn't have wanted to to divorce her, you know, because I mean, as many people have tried to interpret, they they try and throw a more positive slant on it and say, well, it was it was a quiet divorce. Show me a quiet divorce, man. Who's not going to be aware of this? You know, Nazareth was like a really small village. You're not going to be doing this in secret. Everybody's got to be, you know, aware of this. How are you going to pull that one off? You're not. You're not. So that's why for me, this reverence idea, because of that definition of justice, which I want to go through and unpack more in light of, you know, how, how should we interpret that word apoluo in Greek? So I, I say here, you know, because I, I don't want to trick anybody. I want you to know that in Greek, apoluo can have multiple meanings. And the meaning chosen for a particular passage is usually determined by the context in which it appears. For example, according to the context, apoluo can mean separate, conceal, hide, distance oneself from, or divorce. It can mean divorce. It can. But remember, it's the context in which you're reading it which determines the interpretation and the subject matter at hand. Who are we talking about here? Well, St. Joseph. Would it not be a tragedy if the foundation of the New Testament hinged upon the possibility of your spiritual father wanting to divorce your spiritual mother? That's a nightmare situation. And think about it. What's another reason why St. Joseph has not got the proper attention that he deserves for the last 1,800 years? Remember, he started kicking in in the last 200 years. Because many people thought, well, I mean, the guy was going to divorce her. I mean, he can't be really that stellar. I mean, I mean, he wanted to, you know, just completely do away with her and be done with it. And so, you know, he's there and we have really no choice but to acknowledge that he did play that role. But remember, there were people at the beginning of the church, as I said at the beginning of this series, that didn't even think that they should call him the father of Jesus. They were, they were like, well, I mean, I don't know. He, he's just kind of a guy that God used. God could have used anybody. He doesn't seem to be that important. And one of the reasons was because they thought, gosh, I mean, the guy was previously married and, and, and had children. And he's, you know, now 80 years old. And now he wants to divorce this one. I mean, stellar. So he just never, people didn't look to him and say, I want to be like that. I want to be like St. Joseph, a man who wanted to divorce his wife. <laughs> That's not, he didn't get elevated. He didn't get highlighted. He didn't get imitated. He didn't get emphasis, you know, the emphasis on him. He was just the, the old man in the back in the icons and in the paintings, almost, almost like an embarrassment. Really, I'm not making this up. Why? Because they interpreted these things because they didn't really know the depth, the gravitas, man, the, the intensity of who St. Joseph is. But now the church has come to be this awareness that he's this, the greatest saint after the Blessed Virgin Mary, more in line with the Holy Spirit than anyone except the Blessed Virgin Mary, filled with greater graces than anyone except the Blessed Virgin Mary fully aware of acting always, whether prosperous or adverse, in union with God's will. In union with God's will. Always. And always giving God his due. That's the term justice. And St. Joseph, the definition of justice. And St. Joseph, remember, is the most just. Wow. So let's, let's keep going with that because... I'm going to read this passage to you here that's in the book. You can read it on your own. Um, okay, what's the big deal? Well, there's a big difference between St. Joseph desiring to divorce his wife versus desiring to distance himself from her out of a sense of justice and reverence. The reverence theory, uh, let's see, the, the latter explanation of what he intended to do, distance himself out of justice and reverence, is what has caused many an erudite scholar to opt for a translation of apoluo that does not mean divorce. And this goes way back, and I'll prove it to you. With great, the, the greatest theologian, St. Thomas Aquinas, talks about this, and many, many others. Today, in light of what the church now clearly discerns to be true about St. Joseph, maintaining the position that St. Joseph desired to divorce his wife is very hard to reconcile with St. Joseph's virtues. After all, 
The idea that St. Joseph intended to divorce his wife places the very foundation of the new covenant of Jesus Christ on shaky ground. Divorcing Mary would have been an extremely unjust thing for St. Joseph to do. He had no proof that she had cheated on him. Right? She's pregnant. Sure, it's, it's baffling to him. But remember, this man knew the scriptures. A virgin is going to be found with child. He knew this. And all of a sudden, he was in the presence of the Ark of the Covenant, of God's dwelling place. He knew what was going on, and he was like, um, I, don't, I, I can't do this. How is it that, that, that I can be the one to be here? And, and he wanted to step out. He needed a further revelation from God, lest I come too close to the ark and die. Remember, there was, there was a, a man in the Old Testament, a, a priest, who the, the ark of the covenant was actually, God bless him, you know, God said nobody could, could touch the ark except the priest, and it was starting to fall, and this guy went to kind of hold it up, and he died simply because he touched it. Well, Joseph was aware of all of this stuff, and all, the, all of a sudden he's seeing that his wife is pregnant, and he knows what's going on. Does that mean that he knew, you know, the the hypostatic union, you know, that God is taking on human nature, or, you know, assuming human nature? He wouldn't have been able to unpack it theologically like that. But he wasn't dumb. He knew that he was in the presence of some great mystery. And he's thinking, um, she belongs to God. And I, I'm unworthy. I cannot come near her. I am, I, I'm not able to do this. I have to give to God what belongs to God. She belongs to God. And the child in her womb comes from God. And so he didn't want to divorce her. He, wanted, he, he was thinking, I can't do this. And out of reverence and justice to God, I have to give to God what belongs to God. Wow. When you look at it from that perspective, that's amazing. Because it's showing that this man is willing to sacrifice a possible future with Mary, the love of his heart. He was in love with her. They were already married, right? He's thinking, I, I, if I have to give to God what belongs to God at great cost to myself, so be it. God comes first. Now, some people have said, but that doesn't seem very just either, Father. I mean, was he walking away from her? How is she going to take care of the child? That doesn't seem right. I, I mean, that doesn't seem to be much better than him actually wanting to divorce her. We'll think this through. In Joseph's eyes, in his heart, in his understanding, he is encountering a virgin who is pregnant. That's not normal. That doesn't happen. If God can bring about a child in a virgin's womb, God is the source of it. God is the real father of the child, well, then certainly God can take care of the mother whom he's espoused and the child in her womb, because both the woman and the child belong to God. If God can make a virgin pregnant, he can certainly take care of her and all of her needs and everything that will be required. So Joseph wasn't thinking he was bailing out. No, God's going to take care of her. And he's thinking, I, I can't. I'm not worthy. I, I, I shouldn't be here. He was aware, he was so self-aware of his own, you know, inability to do this task that he was like, I, I, I got to step back quietly, reverently, but I got to distance myself and I got to wait for, for God to tell me what to do here. And did it hurt him? Oh, you bet it did. He was being put to a test. He had to be willing to sacrifice everything, the desire, the joy, the beauty of his heart. Why? Because he was going to be a new Abraham. Remember the old Abraham in the Old Testament who was asked to sacrifice his son. At the last second, God, you know, through his angel, he doesn't ask him to do that. It was a test. Are you going to, are you going to obey God on every level, even something that seems contradictory and seems crazy? You have to go all the way. And so that's what Joseph was willing to do. And he passed with flying colors. And God made him... A new, like a new Adam, a new Abraham, the father of a new covenant with children more numerous than the stars of the heavens because of his faithfulness, because of his self-sacrificing heart. That's what God did for Joseph. That's our spiritual father. All right. So does this mean that for 2000 years, the church was wrong? 
about a very important aspect of divine revelation? I mean, this is part of the scriptures. No, it doesn't mean that at all. Remember, since the time that the New Testament was written and, you know, codified, set in, you know, its officialness by the Catholic Church, the Church has allowed for various translations of Apolluo, just like the one that I, I read to you. So it's not that, like we've come up with, oh, the Church got it wrong. No, we've had this multiple possibilities of how to interpret this. And now that we've got this development of St. Joseph and his understanding of his greatness and, and his virtue being the most just, we need to relook at it. We need to look to see if, well, in some of these translations, maybe, maybe we do need to give a preferential option for the reverence theory now, in light of what we now have affirmed. And the church has affirmed this. We're praying that litany every day, calling him the most just, the pillar of families. Would, would the man who we call the pillar of families be the same man who wanted to divorce his wife? That don't even make sense. Would the man that we, we call the glory of domestic life be the man who wanted to divorce his wife? Don't even make sense. Because that's not what he wanted to do. He, he encountered this mystery and he thought of himself so lowly and in awe and unworthy of doing it. And that's exactly what God wanted to hear. That's exactly what God wanted for him. Because then God knew. God knew, right? But Joseph had to pass that test, get the stamp. You are the man, Joseph. I can trust you with everything. You're willing to sacrifice your own heart. You're, you're the love of your life. You're willing to give up everything to do my holy will. You are the man, Joseph. And I'm going to make you so fruitful that everybody's going to call you spiritual father. Everybody. <laughs> That's what we're dealing with here, my friends. That's what God did. So uh, this stuff, just for me, it changes so much when you, when you, when you read that passage in Scripture and in, and in your prayer life, you know, when, you, when you're praying through these things. Okay. Now, there's been some, some recent theologians and great ones that have talked about this. I'll mention them first, and then we'll back up through history, and we'll mention, you know, the, the, some great saints, some incredible saints to talk about this. Um, I don't know if you've heard of this guy, Father Rene Laurentin. He was uh, the greatest Mariologist of the 20th century. I actually, he was one of my teachers uh, in, uh, when I got my licentiate in Mariology. I, he, he, I had him for the last class that he taught. He was amazing. He was so brilliant, this guy. I think he died just a few years ago. And I think he was maybe just a few days shy of his hundredth birthday, I think. I mean, he, you know, he was, he was up there. And then you got Father John McHugh, who's got a phenomenal volume on this whole thing. Father John Sayward, who, Sayward, who's a convert, still alive, uh, writes about this. And then probably one of the greatest uh, theologians who's now deceased, he, he died not too long ago, Father Ignace de la Poterie. This guy wrote a book, which is out of print, and it's ridiculous what they're selling it for. Like if you find it on Amazon, I mean, literally, it would be selling for like 900 bucks. It's worth it, but, I mean, that's insane. Um, the book is called Mary and the Mystery of the Covenant. Oh, man, it's a masterpiece. It is brilliant theological stuff, bringing together the best of the tradition uh, with th what I'm talking about here, with wanting to, you know, emphasize some of these things that the church and her development has come to understand now. And he gives, in my opinion, what is the most phenomenal translation of that passage from Matthew. I'm not going to read it again and not going to read his translation. It's in the book. You can read it. Okay. Um, let's see. I've kind of hammered some of these points. I don't have to dwell on them too long. Uh, I'm wondering, all right, let's get into some of these uh, figures. Most of them are saints from way back that talk about exactly what I've been telling you, this reverence theory, because it's been there from the beginning of the church. And I want you to know that, lest you think, well, this is Father Calloway and some, you know, recent theologians are saying this, but, you know, show it from, from the old school guys, from the fathers of the church and all that. All right, no problem. So the first one we're going to read from is Origen. Now, that's a dude. That's his name. It's a weird name, I have to admit. Um, I mean, it's kind of cool name, but it's different. Um, and he's not a saint because, remember, he's that guy who took that passage from Scripture literally, literally about um, if your right arm causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. 
well, he had a certain appendage that caused him to sin and he cut it off. So yeah, he, he ain't going to get canonized. So he, that, that was a big mistake. So this is what he says, but he, he has great writings. And so I'm reading, he wasn't a heretic or anything. He just, you know, was like radical. I'm radical, but I ain't that radical. All right. Joseph was just, and the virgin was immaculate. But when he, Joseph, wished to put her away, this happened from the fact that he recognized in her the power of a miracle and a vast mystery which he himself, which he held himself unworthy to approach. Humbling himself, therefore, before so great and ineffable a phenomenon, he sought to retire, just as St. Peter humbled himself before the Lord and said, Depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. And as the ruler confessed who sent word to the Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst enter under my roof, for I have considered myself not even worthy to come to thee. You see, isn't that fascinating what we're dealing with here? Remember, they weren't living together yet. And so when he encountered this, he's thinking, I, we can't be under the same roof because I'm not worthy to be in the same dwelling place as this holy woman and the child in her womb. Or as St. Elizabeth said to the most blessed virgin, and how have I deserved that the mother of my Lord should come to me? In like manner did the just man Joseph humble himself and fear to enter into a union with such exalted holiness. See, this dude origin for all of his other faults, got it. He understood it. But let's get into the saints. St. Basil the Great. This is a great, great saint. Joseph discovered both Mary's pregnancy and and its cause, namely, that it was of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, he feared to be called the husband of such a wife and wished to put her away privately since he did not dare to reveal what had taken place in her. Yet because he was just, he desired a revelation of the mystery. And he waited. And that's when God sent his angel to him to tell him, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. You are the man. You have passed the test. St. Ephraim the Syrian. Oh, he's a great one too. If you don't know much about him, he was great. He has a lot of poetry and beautiful stuff on Our Lady. But he, St. Joseph, thought especially of sending her away so as not to commit a sin and allowing himself to be called the father of the Savior. He knew what was going on. He feared to live with her lest he dishonor the name of the virgin's son. That is why the angel said to him, do not fear to take Mary to your home. All right, let's get into a heavy-duty one. St. Bernard of Clairvaux. He is called the Marian doctor. You know, when you're a doctor of the church, they give you sometimes a designation. You know, the angelic doctor, St. Thomas Aquinas, or the doctor of grace, you know, uh, St. Augustine, or doctor of this, doctor of that. He's called the Marian doctor, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, because he was like super Marian. This is what he said. Why did he, St. Joseph, wish to leave her? Listen now, no longer to my opinion, but to that of the fathers of the church. Joseph wanted to leave her for the same reason Peter begged the Lord to leave him when he said, Depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. And for the same reason the centurion kept him from his house, saying, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. Thus Joseph considering himself unworthy and a sinner, said to himself that a man like him ought not to live under the same roof with a woman so great and exalted, whose wonderful and superior dignity filled him with awe. He saw with fear and trembling that she bore the surest signs of the divine presence. And since he could not fathom the mystery, he wanted to depart from her. Peter was frightened by the greatness of the power. The centurion feared the majesty of the presence. Joseph, too, as a human being, was afraid of the newness of the great miracle, the profundity of the mystery, and so he decided to leave her quietly. Are you surprised that Joseph judged himself unworthy of the pregnant virgin's company? After all, have you not heard that St. Elizabeth, too, could not endure her presence without fear and all? As she says, whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? This, then, is why Joseph decided to leave her. Did you hear the word divorce in any of that? No. And that was in circulation at the time. He could have totally put the word divorce in there, but he didn't. Because he was talking about reverence. Joseph knew what was going on, considered himself unworthy, 
and distanced himself from this presence and waited for a further revelation because he knew that this woman and the child in her holy womb belong to God. Give to God his due. Do not take from God what belongs to God. That's what he was encountering. That's why we call him the most just, because he's sacrificial to the point of emptying himself, no matter what, prosperous or adverse, at all times, in accord with God's will, and giving God his due. That's St. Joseph. St. Thomas Aquinas, the greatest theologian, the angelic doctor, said this, According to St. Jerome and Origen, remember we read from Origen, Joseph had no suspicion of adultery because he knew the modesty and chastity of Mary. Moreover, he had read in Scripture that the virgin would conceive and that a shoot should sprout from the stock of Jesse and from his roots a bud shall blossom. He knew also that Mary was descended from the line of David. Thus it was easier for him to believe that Isaiah's prophecy had been accomplished in her than to think that she could have let herself descend into debauchery. That's, I can't even, just to think that St. Joseph would have suspected her of, you know, cheating on him. That just, oh, the thought disgusts my soul. That is why, considering himself unworthy to live with a person of such great sanctity, he wanted to send her away secretly. Like when Peter says to Jesus, depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. And there's so many more that I could go through. That Again, I had to limit myself with how many I put in here. Or the book would be this thick. But let's go to a mystic, one I haven't mentioned yet, St. Bridget of Sweden. Right? I've talked about Venerable Mary Vigrida, Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich, maybe some others. Well, now we're going to get into this one, uh, uh, St. Bridget of Sweden. She was awesome. And our Lord and Our Lady frequently appeared to her you know, in private revelations. But check this out. This is what the Virgin Mary herself said to St. Bridget of Sweden. This is on page 150. From the moment I, Mary, gave my consent to God's messenger, Joseph, seeing that having conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, I was pregnant and that I was growing, wondered greatly. Because he would not suspect evil, but remembered the words of the prophet, who foretold that the Son of God would be born of a virgin, he reputed himself unworthy to serve such a mother until the angel in a dream commanded him not to fear, but to minister to me with charity. These are the words of the Blessed Virgin Mary to St. Bridget of Sweden. You know what's fascinating about that? These are the exact same words that the Blessed Virgin Mary would have told St. Matthew. Think about it. Where do we get the infancy narratives in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke? Matthew and Luke weren't there when it all went down. Well, they weren't living in Nazareth. They weren't aware of what you know, an angel came to a virgin, you know, of the tribe of, you know, they clueless. They were little, probably little children themselves. They had no idea. So, so this, you know, this always cracks me up because you got scholars today. And these are intelligent people, man. You know, they got PhDs and doctorates and they know so many languages. It's, it's crazy. But in so many ways, they are like theologically dumb because they, they see the stories of the infancy narratives of Matthew and Luke, and they don't know where they come from, either than they come up with stupid theories like, well, they had to kind of fudge an infancy narrative because, you know, there's other stories of, you know, deities from the Middle East that, you know, this particular group of people talked about. So we need to kind of come up with one of those to give it a history of how Jesus, you know, came about and so we're just going to kind of create a narrative here and throw it in there and, and hope that we you know it slides through and people don't start asking questions <laughs> that is so stupid man how do you think that matthew and luke were aware of how this all went down mary told them they're right i don't need a phd to know this that's why the blessed were her sons when they were writing these things down of what to put in there of things that they had no idea mary told them so when we get st the story of, of Jesus' birth, how, how does Joseph end up in the New Testament in, in most instances? Because Mary put him there. <laughs> Seriously. It's the Blessed Virgin Mary who's actually talking about him. And would, would Mary, see my Facebook thing went out again because uh, the devil doesn't want people you know, hearing this stuff. When, when, when Mary was telling Bridget of Sweden this centuries later, would she have been telling St. Matthew um, he wanted to divorce me. Is that what Mary would have said? 
Because that would co totally contradict what she told St. Bridget of Sweden. It was out of reverence that, you know, he wanted to distance himself from, not divorce. And he waited for a further revelation because he knew the prophecy of Isaiah and he's encountering it. And he's like, I I'm not, I, I can't, I'm unworthy. I'm in awe. God, what do you want me to do? What Mary told St. Bridget is the exact same thing she would have told St. Matthew when he wrote it down. That's why now coming to know the all these things I've been telling you, we've got to reinterpret that word apoluo, not as divorce, but as wanting to distance himself out of reverence for the mystery that he's encountering. That's what we're dealing with here, my friends. That's what we're dealing with here. All right. Um, yeah, the reverence theory teaches us that God... That wait, the reverence theory teaches us that in the mind and heart of Saint Joseph, God comes first. Doesn't matter what the sacrifice is going to be, no matter how much it'll pain you to go through a difficulty and a hardship, you will be rewarded beyond you, anything you can imagine if you give God His due, if you give what belongs to Him to Him, never seek to deprive that His glory. And everything that belongs to him. See, this is what we've forgotten in modern times. This is why we have got to adhere to this, this virtue of justice. Not just these social justice warrior crazies out in the world, right? Talking a totally warped understanding of, of most of what we're talking about here. We're talking about holiness. We're talking about such love for God that we want to give him his due. We want to go to mass faithfully. You know, because a lot of people say, well, I don't go to church because, you know, I don't get anything out of it. I got news for you. It ain't about you, homie. It's about you giving God his due because he's worthy and you owe it to him. And as I, I think I put in the same chapter, and ain't even about how stellar, you know, it's going to be. Because I'll be the first to tell you, a lot of times at mass, the music sucks. You know, the, the fellowship sucks. It ain't about that. It really isn't. Now, every priest should be able to preach, because I'll be the first to tell you, too. Most homilies that I hear suck. They're so lame, it's ridiculous. I'm like, wow, dude, seriously, wow, that's what you're giving to the people? They're going to listen to you for like 10 minutes once a week, and that's what you're laying down in front of them? That is so lame, it's ridiculous, you know? But again, it ain't even about the homily. It's about you giving God his due, and he's told you how to do it. Do this in memory of me. Do this. You're not going to be able to up Jesus. You're not because a lot of people, again, they're like, remember, I talked about the beginning. Oh, I'm, I'm a spiritual person. I'm not into institutionalized religion. You know, well, that's lame. And that's a cop out because you think that, you know, a better way to give God his due than the way that Jesus Christ, the son of God, told you how to do it. You don't, bro. You don't. You got to humble yourself. You got to realize you ain't worthy. And you ain't given no gift that's worthy of God unless you give the gift that God, knowing this, gave you himself to offer to him in the holy sacrifice of the mass. That's what we're dealing with here. That's why we got to look to St. Joseph. Even if it pains me to go and listen to some of these goofy songs that we sing, I'm giving God his due. Even if I go and, you know, I... All the people are just yap, yap, yap and talking, and it's just one big, gigantic social event before Mass. And, you know, I'm just like, ah, I can't even pray because everybody's just talking, and homie's up there singing some lame song we got to practice for, the, you know. I'm here to give God his due. I pray that, you know, there is a place where all this is done differently, and there are those places where you can go to a holy liturgy where people don't yap, 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 and people are dressed reverently and piously and modestly. Oh, I long for the days when this is the norm. Used to be, but it's not anymore, unfortunately. I mean, there's places for sure. This is why we got to look to him. This is why we got to look to the just man. We need to be like him. We got to be sacrificial. We've got we've got to go the distance. We got to be long distance runners here, and we'll be rewarded. We've got to make the sacrifice, whether prosperous or adverse. We got to be like Saint Joseph, my friends. We got to be like Saint Joseph. Okay. So I think I'm going to end it there today. We've gone a very long time, and I apologize. Oh, I'm so sorry. I know, I know, I know. It just goes forever. So remember, we're not doing the uh, the contest announcement today. We'll do that tomorrow. So today we're praying the Litany of St. Joseph in English because yesterday we prayed it in Latin. So the Litany is on page 233 in the book. Okay? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ have mercy, Christ have mercy. 
Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Christ hear us, Christ graciously hear us. God the Father of heaven, have mercy on us. God the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy on us. God the Holy Spirit, have mercy on us. Holy Trinity, one God, have mercy on us. Holy Mary, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Noble offspring of David, pray for us. Light of patriarchs, pray for us. Spouse of the Mother of God, pray for us. Chase guardian of the Virgin, pray for us. Foster father of the Son of God, pray for us. Zealous defender of Christ, pray for us. Head of the Holy Family, pray for us. Joseph most just, pray for us. Joseph most chaste, pray for us. Joseph most prudent, pray for us. Joseph most courageous, pray for us. Joseph most obedient, pray for us. Joseph most faithful, pray for us. Mirror of patience, pray for us. Lover of poverty, pray for us. Model of workmen, pray for us. Glory of domestic life, pray for us. Guardian of virgins, pray for us. Pillar of families, pray for us. Comfort of the afflicted, pray for us. Hope of the sick, pray for us. Patron of the dying, pray for us. Terror of demons, pray for us. Protector of the Holy Church, pray for us. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, spare us, O Lord. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, graciously hear us, O Lord. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. He has made him Lord of his household and prince over all his possessions. Let us pray. O God, who in your loving providence chose blessed Joseph to be the spouse of your most holy mother, grant us the favor of having him for our intercessor in heaven, whom on earth we venerate as our protector, you who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for filling the heart of St. Joseph with such reverence for you as God Almighty that he desired to sacrifice everything, the desire, the delight of his heart, because he believed firmly that Mary and the child in her womb belong to you. Heavenly Father, this is the greatness of St. Joseph. Let the church be aware, become aware of this, acknowledge this in her liturgy, in her preaching, in her writings. Let this greatness of our spiritual father be known and help all of us seek to imitate him, Father, that we would always seek to give you your due through being faithful to our attendance at, at Holy Mass, being faithful and giving you always that worship that belongs to you, that is owed to you. And help us to be just in all our relations with everyone in our lives, to give them their due as well. We ask all of this through Jesus and Heavenly Father as your priest. I bless everyone here, their families, their intentions, and especially for conversions. The blessing of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, guys. So we'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow we got a really cool reading. It's a shorter one, I promise. Uh, but it's going to be really awesome. You guys are going to be really loving tomorrow what we're going to cover. Remember, ite ad Yosef, go to Joseph. God bless you, and we'll see you tomorrow.